I initially wanted to get you on for you know the the review that you did of of mm-hmm. uh, Lindsay and Pluck Grose's um, book, but I think everything that's happened over the past twenty four hours has been kind of crazy, and yeah. in a lot of ways, I think it it coincides with it pretty good. Yeah, um, yeah, no, uh, there's right like sort of broader issues of like culture wars and like interpretations of social issues and uh you know if 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 you go to James Lindsay's you know Twitter feed right now you will see that uh I think the way that he advocates looking through uh like the sort of lens he advocates looking through in scholarship he is wearing the same ones if not even more cynically shaded ones uh now just looking at everything yeah what uh, what gra- what made you gravitate towards like james Lindsay and his <laughs> stuff <laughs> yeah good question good question why did i fall into this trap yeah uh, so Cause there's a lot you know there's a lot of other there's, people there's as that well. right yeah there and and once you do fall in like i i, I fully was sucked into the james Lindsay rabbit hole i mean like mm-hmm. this dude's uh website new discourses i mean he's just out there putting out like twenty thousand words a week sometimes yeah. uh, haven't haven't read anything off that in a while but um so how i found out about james Lindsay was it was my it was 2018 right when the grievance studies affair mm-hmm. or uh Sokol squared affair happened and you know, the YouTube algorithm gave me a suggestion for a clip off the Joe Rogan show where they were talking, where it was uh, Peter Bogosian and James Lindsay and Joe Rogan talking about what they did. And it's like it's like the the first 20 years or so minutes of that episode that they're on uh, Rogan. And mm. I listened to it and I found what they were saying pretty compelling like i was like oh shit sounds like they're uh they're pointing out some problems and then i talked to my brother about it my brother is my younger brother he's more social justice leaning than i am although we're both very far to that side of the political spectrum but i you know sometimes can be convinced uh, more easily that like there are these excesses that uh, the left goes too far in. And my brother sort of like pushed back on some of these things. I was like, what, but what about this? Like they got this article published in this thing. And my brother was more focused on like the, you know, that's, that's unethical for the, for him to like, just like make this up and waste these people's time reviewing it. Then I, you know, applied it, this came up like while I was applying to grad schools Mm -hmm. and I haven't really looked at this stuff since then until this summer. Mm -hmm. So this summer we have culture wars ramp up to a 12 with the George Floyd um, protests, George Floyd inspired and Breonna Taylor inspired protests and the like narratives surrounding these things and, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Uh, somehow, somehow I came across James Lindsay's Twitter, and I had never seen his Twitter before. And this was right around when James Lindsay started to like go hard on Twitter. <laughs> he was like just turning into like a complete troll. Yeah, all the time. <laughs> Even his like subtitle, right? It's like some king of something. I, I just saw it like not too long ago, but yeah, it's, no, still, it's yeah, very trolly. Um, self-aggrandizing shit. And he's and he he just he trolls. It's so frustrating because someone could raise like a good objection to his point and then he'll just still say some troll shit because he has so many followers that are like like really like blindly devoted to him that they will just like carry it. Mm-hmm. So okay, so what did happen? How did I come across i don't remember exactly what it was but i came across his twitter and i was just like oh geez like 
why is he like this? You know, what, <laughs> what's going on? Like, my last impression of him was like, oh, he's doing this like reasonable thing. So then uh, I asked my good friend, Yanai, who um, Yanai and I had just been in a class together called Decolonial Feminist Ethics and Epistemology. And that was like a whole new frontier for me. I had never taken uh, a class in like in these sorts of decolonial scholarship and certain uh, uh, feminist philosophy as well. So I learned a lot. Um, but there was some stuff that uh, that I thought, you know, I was like, oh, what? How does this make sense? Like, he's like claims of like, you know alternative knowledges without a relativism but they're still also anti-objective and i was just like trying to piece these things together it's not just sound like confusing so yanai and i would have a lot of conversations from that class and he was always good at keeping me in check of like making sure i'm not just like intuitively reacting ne uh, negatively to to a mm. piece of scholarship and so I asked Yanai, like, what do you think about the the uh, grievance studies affair? And he was like, oh, it's such reactionary bullshit. Like, you, like, and then he like gave me a huge string of messages. He linked me to a thread by uh, Brian Earp, who's a good um, philosopher at Yale, I believe. Um, and so then I started being like, you know, I started to realize like the the uh, empirical shortcomings of the hoax because you know there wasn't like a control like and they they weren't sending it to a mm -hmm. bunch of different journals. Um, mm -hmm. Then there was also the fact that most people who took anything away from that did not read the journal articles themselves and did not come to their own conclusions. And then when I realized that. I went and started to read the articles myself, starting with um, the article they got accepted in the feminist philosophy journal Hypatia, mm -hmm. because that was the one journal on the list that was actually like, you know, pretty high up recognizable journal. The others I was like, you know, okay, you got a, a, a paper published in what was like a sexuality studies okay mm -hmm. right, i don't never heard of it. uh there yeah. was one that was in the the journal of po the journal of poetry therapy you know it's a big time journal <laughs> yeah. <laughs> clearly this field is is corrupt uh yeah but so yeah i read the one in hypatia and i was like what the fuck because they they advertise it as this paper that was you know, it was so it was so radical. It was arguing that you're never allowed to criticize social justice ideas. That's how they framed it in their uh, their like expose on their blog or their website. I read the article and it was just like a really good analysis of how satire is not itself a valid form of critique because it doesn't expose anything you know if, if you have something satirical and you draw a conclusion that like this is like invalid from it it's already it's it, you have to already believe that whatever it is that you're satirizing is invalid so it's it doesn't mm -hmm. critique anything and so they are like dunking on themselves writing this paper because <laughs> their, whole, their whole methodology is just based on satire anyways yeah. so that is how I like got <laughs> back into this James Lindsay thing. Uh, so James Lindsay, like the, the main player on the, on those, um, you know, that whole project, but Helen Pluckrose was actually the primary author of the book. Mm. And uh, James Lindsay came in after and okay. added his points and, I've read so much of his work now that I can like tell which, you know, annoying <laughs> metaphors are his. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. Cause you know, when I first came across it, like one of my friends, he, he went down that like rabbit hole starting with Jordan Peterson. 
And yeah, you know, then I hear about the, you know, the fiasco at like Evergreen College with Brett Weinstein yeah, and then yeah. like all these different things like that are, they're linked into that little web. And I think the thing that stood out the most with the James Lindsay and the whole grievance studies thing is like, have you ever seen, um, was it the other guys? It's with Will Ferrell and, uh, Mark Wahlberg. I haven't actually seen it myself. It's, no, there's, there's a point where, um, Mark Wahlberg shows that he like knows ballet really well. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, he explains to Will Ferrell's character that I uh, see, I learned it just to show these other guys that they were queer, you know, like really terrible. But uh-huh, what he yeah. said is like, so you learned it sarcastically, right? That's, that's the point. And I feel like understanding the way that they went through, you know, actually publishing the articles, like they got rejected the first several times before they got into yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. Before, like it took a long time before they actually got something submitted and accepted. It's like they sarcastically actually learned theory vernacular and all these things yeah. that you needed to learn in a field in order to even do it and i, I just felt like that de- defeated the purpose of it being just wild like they just submitted this journal and it got accepted i, I felt like that was a little bit of a bait and switch like it, it wasn't as straightforward as they submitted some bs and got it sub- like accepted right. it was more they did the work they understood the, la- the language the theory and the, everything that they wanted to sort of argument in there and then got it published like months later and I don't yeah, know, there's like, something about that that seems really disingenuous. I agree. I agree. And there's, uh, are you familiar with the podcast, uh, Very Bad Wizards? No. I'm okay. Not. So Very Bad Wizards, highly recommend to anyone interested in philosophy and psychology and culture war. Not, not so much culture. They don't talk a lot about culture wars. They do like, uh, some literature stuff and some, some movie stuff as well. Um, but, uh, really, really funny podcast, like probably my favorite academic podcast. Um, they had an episode where, so did you ever hear about the hoax the year before with James Lindsay and Peter Bogosian, the conceptual penis? No. Oh, <laughs> what is that? <laughs> so, so before grievance studies was even, uh, in, James's pregnant mind before it was even conceived of uh, James Lindsay thought that he could debunk gender studies with one paper that he wrote with um, with Peter Bogosian called the conceptual penis as a social construct mm-hmm. and see James Lindsay didn't really know how he didn't know what he was doing basically because he submitted it to a pay to publish journal that will Um, publish predatory journals. Yeah. Right. Right. So, so it's, and it's, and it wasn't even, so he was trying to debunk gender studies specifically where he got this specific animosity towards gender studies in particular. I don't know, but it, it really is like, it's, it's his least favorite. I think, no, probably now it's like critical race theory. He shits right. on that a lot more these days, but in the uh, in the grievance studies days, it was all gender theory. And actually, if you look at the papers that they got accepted, none of them were in any of the any of the other areas really. But um, mm-hmm. so yeah, so he thought I'll debunk gender studies by writing conceptual penis and getting mm-hmm. it published in this journal and. It was a generic social science uh, pay to publish journal. Mm-hmm. And then so that happened. He's like, oh, we got it published. And then he went over to the Skeptic magazine. I, I, it's like this like atheism community, I guess. Uh, and wrote a whole write up about, you know, how this is uh, devastating for the field, I guess. Mm. And put it out there and like Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins and maybe some other people were like, this is brilliant. Excellent. <laughs> I think Steven Pinker too is like, you know, this is great mm-hmm. takedown mm-hmm. of gender studies and <laughs> every like academic who wasn't also a celebrity was like, what are you doing? Like this is just paid. You didn't show anything. 
Mm-hmm. But uh, so v- the very bad Wizards guys had like mentioned, I guess they were tweeting about it. And then fa- some fans were like, yo, you should have James Lindsay like come defend himself <laughs> like on, on your on your uh, podcast. And if you know, like if you follow James Lindsay now, he would never go debate anyone like he doesn't he does he he does not hop on platforms with people who are going to criticize him to his face like he just he he doesn't do it but he did back then uh (laughs) and it's one of my favorite pieces of content on the internet uh just so excellent the guys are like so respectful but and he starts to like really get pissed uh (laughs) <laughs> it's it's wow. great. what do they say how do they, well how do they take <laughs> so it's it starts by you know them being like so you know there's like this, this clear confound because we can't determine at all how much we should take away f- uh from your papers being published anything about gender studies at all um because one this is a pay to publish journal. And two, it's not even a gender studies journal. And mm-hmm. then he's like, yeah, but uh, <laughs> he tries to defend it with a, an analogy. He's like, let me ask you a question. Why is, uh, oh, who was it? Why is Alec Baldwin's impression of Donald Trump funny? Right. Yeah, he, he just like, asked that question. Mm-hmm. Or why is it so successful? It's like, well, obviously the answer is like because it's uh, accurate or it reflects <laughs> something true. Um, and he's like, you know, that's it. And like that's the that's like the heart of good satire. Is like, it's mm. <laughs> well, okay, yeah. But uh, but you can't conclude anything from you're having written a paper that it like mirrors the language of gender theory that yeah. there's something wrong with gender theory you have to give us an argument for the part that it's wrong right. <laughs> like yeah it's only like that that paper is, is interesting because uh you know one of the guys david pizarro makes a makes a really good point very forcefully which is like what james Lindsay is trying to do right and let's say if if he were to to be successful what he would be pointing out would be a kind of impulse to follow one's moral ideology rather than like the goodness of the the argument in in a in a field like gender studies right moral uh moral like reasoning mm-hmm. and So if he could point that out, that's what he would be hoping to do. And when he comes out with a piece like the conceptual penis and Mm -hmm. people respond to it properly and he expects them to respond to it properly, it's exactly the same. You have your moral ideology that says, oh, well, the gender study is bad and, uh, you know, looks good to me. So the confirmation bias is there. Uh, And... I don't think James really addresses that point. He tried to sort of like tries to dodge it. Uh, it <laughs> so <laughs> the 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 other guy Tamler like isolates isolates like okay why gender studies like tell me like what is it about gender <laughs> studies like and <laughs> then James Lindsay says how many articles have come out this year by Jonathan Haidt and Steven Pinker and respectable scholars in their fields um, about the problems of the, cr- the crisis of the university campus, right? That like, that's his answer. It's like, okay, okay but what about, what are you talking about gender, right? <laughs> <laughs> you, just, you just, you can't really come up with anything. And then yeah. he says, like, well, the language that they're using, they they are right now at UC Riverside. They are uh, campaigning to make one gender studies course required for all students. It's like, okay, once again, 
that doesn't show that anything is wrong <laughs> with gender study. Yeah. Yeah, they do that with a lot of courses. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah like oh, they're they're campaigning to make an American history requirement at this yeah. point. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's one of several requirements that universities always have. I don't know. It's yeah, th- yeah. There was there was actually no gender studies requirement at my school. I, I you know, maybe I I just got lucky. <laughs> I mean, mine either. Yeah. God, uh, you're over at NYU, right? Uh, right. the, the city university of New York, CUNY, oh, okay. uh, CUNY, CUNY grad CUNY. center. Yeah. Okay. And how long have you been in your program? I'm in my second year now. So, second year. uh, just taught my first class last semester and we'll oh, nice. be teaching again this one. Nice. Yeah. And how about you in your program? I'm in my third year and, um, yeah, it's I'm finished with like my PhD requirements and I'm doing it with a, a dual a MPH. So I'm also doing it in epidemiology, which oh, I'll cool. be done with it this semester. So I'll, I'll be happy about that. Um, yeah, but nice. my own research pulls a lot from like phenomenology at this point. And so I'm looking at certain literature and, and um, a lot of anthropologists pull from philosophy quite a bit. And I think that's why yeah. I've sort of been interested in these, like Derrida's uh, ontology that he mentions like mm-hmm. a couple of times in his book. Like I don't, think, of- I don't, I don't think that he actually read it. Um, I, I don't think that they really read any of the uh, French postmodernists at all. Yeah, <laughs> and I guess that's that's a big point, right? Like what you said earlier that your friend tells you, like that you know, don't intuitively react. I yeah. think we are highly reactionary. Like, mm-hmm. I, I, in your writing about it, like, I, I do think there's there's something about it that can be legitimately argued, right? Like, um, talking about systems of power and privilege, sanctifying victimhood. I guess that's what they sort of said. And okay, like, if we talked about theories of power and critical be- theory being one of those, like you talked about how, you know there is an extent to which you kind of take that a little too far, I guess, in terms of like now everything's subsumed to like power, just the same way you can say that, you know, you can be highly skeptical, right. And Mm -hmm. you you can be so skeptical to the extent that you can be so skeptical of your own like brain, you know, like there's an extent to which you can do that, you know, if you go far enough. And I think in terms of like a theory of power, you can say that. And I think that's one of the things that, I don't think they really do, right? They they more just sort of blanket it all into like social justice warrior isms and that's it. Yeah, so it, it, it depends on what part of the book we focus on specifically. So like when they give their interpretation of Foucault's analysis of uh, power, it's it's just, it's so it seems to me now that it's like just clearly wrong. But I hadn't mm-hmm. read any Foucault um, when I first came across the book. I went and focused um, most in in the most detail on the chapter eight because that was the chapter full of philosophers. And I was like, "Wait a minute! Why are they? Why is the the sort of um, the ultimate boogeyman of of like social <laughs> justice scholarship academic philosophers? Like this is strange." Um, yeah. And so I spent most of my time in the review or basically all my time in the review on chapter eight. And for a couple months, I was working on putting together a more detailed uh, or a, a, a detailed critique specifically of the first chapter where they talk just about the French postmodernists. And mm-hmm. it became so tedious that I just sort of like stopped working on it. Not to say that I'll never finish it. I probably will. Um, But I have a a Twitter thread uh, responding to a uh, New Discourses blog piece that Helen Pluckrose wrote called uh, How French Intellectuals Ruined the West, I believe it's called. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And it like has basically all the same 
mischaracterizations of the same four philosophers, uh, Foucault, Derrida, Lyotard, and Baudrillard. And uh, it's, 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 it's ridiculous um, what they do over there. But <laughs> how, they, how they characterize Foucault in the book is like, um, you know, Foucault, for Foucault, everything is just power. And power always has this relationship with knowledge. And knowledge, what is true and what, it, what counts as knowledge is just determined by these power structures. Um, and the power structure is like, this, I mean, this, this part is right, is like, for Marx, power sort of comes like more top down um, from the elite or oppressor class onto the exploited class, they ex exert the power downwards. For Foucault, it's like a grid of power, where everyone is always sort of both uh, acting and act and being acted upon, right? Mm. and or just like influencing and being influenced and if they if they just like thought a little bit closer or just maybe i don't know maybe read some foucault they would because foucault emphasizes now i'm so i got this book i've been reading adorno mm. foucault and the critique of the west um good stuff. And Foucault makes resistance, as does Adorno, crucial to his philosophy of the self, to his metaphysics, to his, his social ontology, everything. Resistance, where, where you find power, you will find resistance. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times in the book, they say, well, well, there's just these power systems, whatever system we live under, the power system just makes the knowledge and we just unquestionably accept it. And that's what it is. It's like, <laughs> uh, sorry, not quite. Um, and that was, yeah. that was one of the crucial points for Foucault is the possibility of resistance always being there so that we can uh, recognize our agency in the world and our ability to, you know, Foucault is kind of like radically individualist, even though he's, often portrayed as like this you know, evil buff gay <laughs> Marxist or some shit. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Yeah. It's like they conflated all of these like ideas into one person. Yes. And then oh, kind man. of say it as if they all believe the same thing. But the yes. thing is, all of these especially people did the not end, believe the same thing. Especially with the social justice scholarship type, because they'll read something. They, they got something from Robin D'Angelo. And then they attribute mm -hmm. it to social or they'll just fucking say the word theory with this capital T. <laughs> which they describe mm -hmm. in the book as if like uh, people call it that they like often mm -hmm. refer to as theory. It's like, no, yeah. no, you guys just did that for this book. But uh, yeah. And <sighs> so the point the point you raised, like, is so right that they'll just sort of like mesh all these figures into one. It's like this sort of like four-headed dragon <laughs> or uh, oftentimes also they will read back into an earlier generation of theory, something from like the next evolution as they put it. So like they'll read mm -hmm. something in Spivak or they'll read something in um, Patricia Hill Collins or Kimberly Crenshaw and then they'll like put that into Derrida or Foucault hmm. and it's like just just no but there, there's an interview yeah. where where Helen like says that that sort of she did take a kind of like backwards approach to writing the book because she was very familiar in her like literature hmm. studies with a lot of these more uh second wave like the post-colonial literature stuff hmm. and so yeah. you know she didn't admit to reading back anything in but you know if i do a little psychoanalysis here i think that might be uh what's going on <laughs> on some level yeah like the thing that you said that they they mentioned on uh 
the very bad wizards podcast that Lindsay mentioned of like yeah. it, it just seems like he he invoked like pinker and all these other people and you know it, it's like it's something that's intuitively true and i think in some ways that's what this book is about right it's something that's intuitively true and picking the literature that creates and reinforces the narrative that they already kind of have and i think that's the uncomfortable thing about it because i it's like these are really interesting ideas that if people actually engaged with would be a really cool debate to have in a public sphere and to be like yeah like actual good faith like you know like be charitable recognize that every theory has its limitations but no that's yeah. not it's not what exactly you get yeah and you know it's interesting because like foucault like i, I know in, in anthropology we tend to draw on foucault a lot as well as pierre bourdieu who both mm -hmm. of them talk about power just in slightly different ways but then when you look at like their whole corpus of research it just it you know it, it's so much more complicated and of yeah. course it is right like no one person is gonna you can only cover what you can and and i think the thing is like when you look at certain theorists drawing in certain like a narrative in order to like make an argument that they're making like foucault's notorious for being like a messy thinker and just doing stuff with history that most people thought you shouldn't have at the time and, and that's sort of the the ground that he carved but in no way does that mean that he's infallible or that right you can't engage and criticize yeah they <laughs> they um so it's cr man the 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 chapter where they actually talk about foucault i believe they they cite him three times um they give one they like attribute just like a claim to the to a whole book they do that a lot in this book you go to mm -hmm. the end notes there's like a specific point that is being um a, attributed to some text and then no page number it's so funny it happens really early on they talk about in the intro they're like talking about social justice right just the idea of social mm -hmm. social justice They're like you know it didn't always have this like identitarian connotation the philosopher john rawls had a theory of social justice uh and then they give a, a sort of like a like a second grade interpretation of john rawls's uh thought experiment in the theory of justice and no page number it's a 500 page book <laughs> god <laughs> <laughs> it's in there somewhere um yeah so, so yeah that that's that's a you know for any academics listening people will know that's it's annoying um so uh but uh what was i gonna say yeah foucault so they they gave like one point they attribute to a whole book um one and then one quote they actually do give the page number but they take it way out of context. And then there's another quote where they give a specific quote and don't give the page number that it's on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's all their analysis of Foucault. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, okay, I'm supposed to somehow get from here to from the, th the little pieces you've given me to thinking that because then the the whole point of setting everything up is to introduce the two postmodern principles and the four postmodern themes. And we're supposed to be able to identify these in all of the works that they're going to show us and mm. that these are supposed to show up in original postmodernism and then the next wave of applied postmodernism and finally reified postmodernism or social justice scholarship. Right. They, they just don't succeed in, in doing that. And I think they they try to like bring it back at every chapter but i mean specifically in the first chapter they're supposed to be able to show us that uh all these postmodernists are committed to cultural relativism which they describe as like the view mm -hmm. that morally and epistemologically all truth claims are equally valid 
I don't think anyone actually believes that. Uh, it's, 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 just, it's like a it's a caricature of what a moral relativist might look like. Like they just yeah they they don't have the philosophy background. It's it's I, yeah. So I guess that goes to another point, right? Like I, I think. I don't know, at least from my perspective, I, I saw all of this first come from like Jordan Peterson talking about postmodernism. Oh my and, god, postmodern postmodern neo Marxism. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and this is all like dredging up stuff from like the science wars from like thirty years ago at this point. And it's like now they're they're now making it relevant again, I guess. But mm-hmm. I think, you know, interestingly enough, like in anthropology, we deal with postmodernism because it has it made us rethink the way that we collect qualitative data, and there were really some yeah. some good questions about the assumptions that we made of the people, and you know all these things. So, you know, it, it naturally had this sort of effect on the field. Um, plus, like anthropology is made up of biological anthropology and archaeology and cultural anthropology and linguistic mm-hmm. anthropology which at the time ended up like departments getting literally broken up because people really didn't agree with each other, right? Um, But there weren't really, I think, in a lot of, like in my undergrad degree, even in my grad degree, like engaging with the the psychology departments, right? I know my friend, he did his his master's in clinical psychology and he he hadn't even heard of postmodernism. It didn't really seem to make that big of an impact in other disciplines like it did in others you know like and i guess that's sort of the point is you know james Lindsay, i think he's a mathematician right yeah (laughs) yeah jordan peterson clinical psychologist like people who disciplinarily didn't really have to deal with what postmodernism meant for the field it just seems like they They have a really one-dimensional modernists too yeah exactly yeah it's just very like narrow their view of it that it's just all bad and that's it yeah and i mean uh so so jordan peterson's understanding is is um there's a lot people have like sort of made a, a big deal out of this i think it's always worth reminding uh everyone that jordan jordan peterson's entire understanding of postmodernism comes from this book called explaining postmodernism by stephen hicks uh, mm. Stephen Hicks is a philosophy professor at a, a university somewhere in Canada, and he got, I'm pretty sure he self-published this book mm. um, because <laughs> like it, 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 it's not with an academic publisher, whatever it is. Um, have you heard of the YouTuber Cuck Philosophy? No. Oh, no, he's <laughs> great. He's great. He does great yeah. uh, postmodernism analysis. So he would probably, con- I, yeah, he he considers himself a, a postmodernist, uh, like ideologically. And he also, I don't know if he would call himself a Marxist, but he has good content on, on Marx as well. But uh, yeah, so he has some good videos exposing the the fraudulence of, of Jordan Peterson's understanding of postmodernism. And then some of his fans sort of were like, you know, you should just get, you you know, cut to the source because Peterson's always talking about that he gets these understandings of postmodernism from Stephen Hicks. And so he made, he made like an hour long video uh, essay critiquing Stephen Hicks's book. And it's, oh, it's, it's good. It's worth, wow. worth investing the hour if, if you're interested. One of my favorite yeah, parts sure. of the entire book, um, which actually I, it comes up in um, my book review because uh, so they cite, so they give an end note in cynical theories saying it's at some point where they're describing like the evolution of postmodernism, where they say like Stephen Hicks's book will be useful. They don't cite him specifically in the text though. I think mm-hmm. they know better because they know nowadays it's like people know that like uh cuck philosophy destroyed Stephen Hicks. Uh, <laughs> but um there's 
there are points in many of James Lindsay's essays on new discourses where he is talking about his understanding of the evolution of uh, German idealism from like Kant to Hegel and then to Marx. Mm. So James Lindsay writes a couple of different places uh, about the anti-enlightenment project of Immanuel Mm -hmm. Kant. Right. So Kant, he he thinks, is an anti-enlightenment thinker. That comes from Stephen Hicks. Uh, Because basically the idea is like, oh, Mm -hmm. Kant thought that we couldn't get at the real things in themselves in the world. And so we're sort of doomed. Oh, no, we can't use our reason because like, I'll never be able to see the thing in itself, even though, you know, Kant is like, but by the way, like, we can still learn about like the phenomenal world using science and observation and all that. And, like, you need your reason for that. You need your reason for abstract uh, reasoning as well, mathematics and logic. Like, reason is the most important shit, guys. But, uh, but no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so crazy because, you know, the way that a lot of these scholars are sort of portrayed is really that they're nonsense and they're just sort of messy and there's nothing to it other than chaos and i think you know jordan peterson that's the point right (laughs) 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 oh god and so i've been getting into deleuze and uh, Mm. atari's uh a thousand plateaus like not reading itself because it's so complex for me but i'm like reading i've never i've never around it i I can't confess to ever trying to lose at all it's 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 tough and i'm i'm reading things about it before i get into it so like Probably other people's idea, right you know good analyses of them you know um and it's interesting uh just thinking about like what all these people are doing all these people that people have uh you know in the 90s uh like bruno latour people thought he was a big postmodernist guy when he's in his book in like 93 he like talked so much shit about postmodernism and how much he hated it. Um, But it's like anything that's not like, you know, hardline science and any sort of criticism of it must be Mm postmodernist. You know, it's it's almost, it's so dichotomous thinking. And ultimately I think Deleuze, Latour, they, they all basically try to explain how it is that we're even trying to represent reality, right? Like trying to represent it, trying to study it, is super hard and we need to kind of check ourselves along the way in order to get there. You know, like thinking of like, you know, a thousand plateaus being all the things that entails what it is that we call reality and the, the, the rhizome he calls it. And, and, you know, all the things that's so complex and so in entangled in our lives, trying to actually get it down. Like when you get down to it, all of them, at least both of them, they understand that there's one reality, you know, but it's highly mediated right, yeah, by the yeah. human mind. And, you know, and, and that's sort of the point, right? Like, like a real engagement with the scholarship, maybe they would have gotten to like some real deal criticisms, but I guess to your point a little bit earlier that you made, like, and this is an uncomfortable thing is right. Like these people are mon- monetizing railing against social justice warriors right james yeah. Lindsay, jordan peterson and that's what makes me uncomfortable it's like Dude. This, there's a misrepresentation and you're profiting off of it so what incentive do you have to not do it there's literally a clip of J- of jordan peterson saying the words i figured out how to monetize social justice warriors you know he's, he's on <laughs> he's on he's, he's joe on rogan podcast. podcast right no yeah. it's uh it, oh yeah it, it's It's either Joe Rogan. Yeah, I think it's a Joe Rogan one. Yeah, I was thinking it was either that or H3, but I do think it's a Joe Rogan episode. Um, Yeah. It's it's the the fucking the guy. Oh, my. Uh, It's so funny, too, because Jordan Peterson is such a postmodernist. Like, you know, like he (laughs) hates postmodernism so much, but oh, my God, he's such a postmodernist. Like the like sermonizing language. He has this weird definition of truth. Like 
he he's he has like a he, he says like a darwinian measure of truth or theory of truth it's like well yeah. how true can it be you know true enough like, <laughs> I'm sorry, that's, that's a really good impression <laughs> you know, yeah i mean it's like we're f- finite beings so how tr- you know it, it is he, he, so he doesn't have like an absolute conception of truth and then you know it, it's so funny you 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 see it a lot when when people talk to him about religious things they ask him like religious mm-hmm. questions so someone ask him a question like do you believe in the bodily resurrection of jesus christ and he was like uh well depends on what you mean by christ uh. <laughs> 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 and it believe too, what right? You mean by belief, you know. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How'd like, you get so good at that? <laughs> uh, I mean, honestly, I I know people who can do it better, and uh, some I I know one. There's this one person on this. Uh, I'm on this uh, this Discord with uh, my friend. Runs like a little like debate Discord, uh, and I was on it a lot more in the summer when I had more free time, but this one guy would get on and just do the Jordan Peterson. It was, it was so good. Uh, and I think just like hearing it and me practicing, um, <laughs> with the, you know, sparring with, with Jordan Peterson and, uh, yeah. you have to get the, the specific like phrases of his, you know, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, he says, well, um, you know, yeah, there's, there's, there's good ones. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, he's so, he's such a postmodernist. Um, I was I'm lost somewhere. Talking no, it's, about that, so, oh conceptions of truth and reality, right. right? So it's it's funny because if <laughs> so, they they uh, at some point they even say like that when they're describing like the relativism like truth relativism or the relativity of of our um like epistemological or truth relativism they they go back and forth and they're trying to describe they're they're trying to lay out the view and at one point they say that postmodernism can be understood as a rejection of the correspondence theory of truth mm-hmm. and so so have you heard of this phrase the correspondence theory okay so it's it's kind of weird to call it a theory but like james Lindsay has had a, a fun uh history of like abusing this concept and on twitter mm-hmm. especially um and you know he's he gets in spats with philosophy Twitter. He's probably blocked most of us by now. Um, huh. But like people will, people would just like educate him, and he would not accept it because he was, you know, he's always right. Uh, but the course of so the correspondence theory of truth would say that uh, a proposition is true just in case it corresponds to reality or corresponds to some state of affairs in the world so uh it is raining is true if in fact it is raining well no that that so that would technically be the uh the deflationist uh view is that a sentence is true so uh it is raining is true if it is raining right so like Mm -hmm. it is raining is true if it is raining that's a deflationist theory but the correspondence theory is making like a metaphysical claim about states of affairs in the world corresponding to the the either the meaning or the words being uttered and so you can start to see well like okay well how is that supposed to work like that's that's kind of yeah. hard to make sense of um, 
because we can't, we don't have this like unmediated access to reality. Like we're thinking through these concepts, like what if our concepts don't map perfectly onto reality? And so that's why a lot of people like there are these that like, that's clearly like a problem. So that leads a lot of people to say, well, okay, the correspondence theory can't be right. And so they instead endorse uh, some kind of coherentist theory, which says that like, no, that's usually, actually, I don't know if people do coherentist theories as theories of truth. I think they're probably more often evoked as theories of knowledge. Mm -hmm. This is honestly out of my depth, but James Lindsay writes saying that postmodernism is based on a rejection of the correspondence theory of truth. None of those mm -hmm. philosophers were thinking about what is it that makes a true statement true metaphysically. That was not mm -hmm. what they were interested in at all. <laughs> what they were interested in is a more like social cultural conception of truth how we come to see things as true why we see those things that we see as true as true rather than not and and how these like knowledge system works at least this is Foucault's main project right and he and Foucault will kind of use knowledge and truth interchangeably sometimes later on he you know in his early work he talks about episteme the the episteme right and that is a sort of uh, uh, like set of rules determining what counts as knowledge. Then later on, he talks about regimes of truth. And it's all the same sort of thing. And I think because they need their book to work and because they need to sound like they're coming up with like something that they can just like knock down they'll say like uh you know you can never really know whether um whether uh we we can have any form of science and you never really know whether it's true like science is just relative it, it might as well just do astrology like uh because it's all it's just culture Whereas, mm -hmm. no, Foucault would never say that. There's, <laughs> there's like probably five or six volumes of interviews where you can search for people asking those kinds of questions and him be like, no, 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 obviously not. That's not what I meant. Yeah. Like yeah. what he's, what he's trying to say is uh, that when you find knowledge claims and when you find knowledge systems, you don't find them, uh, by themselves uh atomized cut off from the rest of society they're always bound up in these in these power systems so like if you're a nazi in nazi germany well your conceptions of who is human and who is not human are going to uh limit actually what kinds of science you can do right hmm. you can't just be a nazi scientist who thinks that that uh, Jewish people, um, you know, actually share the exact same kinds of uh, genes as uh, as non-Jewish people, right? You know, no, you can't do that. Same thing with like, I mean, I've see this is what happens when you start reading these people too much. You start over justifying uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the defenses that are like, okay, clearly I've I've made my point. Yeah, no, it's good. It's you know, in thinking about how all of this bleeds into like what happened yesterday, like <laughs> interestingly enough, I guess that's the the irony is that like the we look on Twitter and we see that there's these poles of ideology, and it's almost like let's say James Lindsay and like you know he's on one pole of it. He's on one side of it, and interestingly enough, he's sort of he himself is reifying, you know, this opposition, and 
you know, it's it's insane to me how you can look on social media and see people really, really sort of clamping down on what it is that they don't agree with and really siding with what they do. And I think the whole Trump election was a really big part of that, right? Like, mm-hmm. look on certain parts of Twitter, you see people saying, you know what, like, we should really look into whether this was a legitimate election, you know, like that should be like the least that we should have. Right. And it seems reasonable enough, you know, like to them and to trying to figure out like, was everything that happened on the up and up. And then you have the other side being like, that's not going to happen. We know that this was legitimate because all the officials from every single state certified it. There was a lot of oversight in every single polling location and, you know, oversight by both party, like, um, people and so you have everyone having their rationales for it and it just seems like there's no mediation of that like there's no one there's no conversation of it it's just building up on both sides of it and then there's like spill over into the real world and then it's like holy shit like didn't know it was that bad (laughs) yeah yeah so this this stuff like endless I find like en- endlessly fascinating. So, social questions of social epistemology and and how uh, so there's a philosopher whose work is really excellent. I always plug when I'm talking about this stuff. Um, his name is uh, C. Ty Win. Um, how do you spell got it? A, uh, last name N G U Y E N, and he's got a paper called. Uh, it's either echo chambers and epistemic bubbles or epistemic bubbles and echo chambers. And it's a nice little distinction of two potentially problematic kinds of social epistemological environments that we find ourselves in specifically on the internet or in social on social media. So an epistemic bubble is is an uh, epistemic environment where sort of only one side of a debate or only one view and not the opposite is encountered, right? So say I don't have any conservative friends on Facebook, right? That would be a a miracle. I, I, I do have some conservative friends on Facebook. But if I didn't, or if I was like on Twitter, and I only followed uh, philosophers or whatever, right, then I would only get like that kind of environment. So that would be an epistemic bubble. And an echo chamber is an epistemic bubble, plus uh, a more pernicious feature. So an an echo chamber is where one view or one kind of view is not only not heard, but is actively undermined mm. and sort of uh, preemptively distrusted. So if I am a conspiracy theorist and I think that, uh, that or you can even do it in terms of like a, a Robin D'Angelo type. So say I'm Robin D'Angelo, I think that all white people are racist. Um, All white people have white fragility. And Mm -hmm. well, if somebody wants to disagree with me, well, we don't trust that because that would just be a manifestation of their white fragility, obviously. (laughs) Right. 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 (laughs) So so you can think of that as a kind of uh, echo chamber, but it would get complicated because, of course, non-white people could come in and say the same thing. And uh, actually, by her own theory, she wouldn't be able to argue with them because they would have more of a, a claim to knowledge there. Uh, mm-hmm. But she doesn't address that crucially uh, for her for her purposes. But yeah. uh, the, the term echo chamber comes from an analysis of uh, Rush Limbaugh's uh, like AM radio where he mm-hmm. he sort of like has this community of like core followers he's pitching them this sort of like all oh, these leftists these liberals they're they're ruining the country whatever i i don't know how he sounds honestly i don't know what this voice is but <laughs> but uh he 
he will tell his listeners like beforehand, like just so you guys know, like these people are going to say that I'm lying about this shit. Right. Mm -hmm. But, but like we all know why they're saying that is because blah, blah, blah. They don't want you to know the truth about this, whatever. So it's like already preemptively undermined. Um, I think James Lindsay cultivates a major echo chamber. Um, I think epistemic bubbles are probably going to be more or less natural, will come up uh, in certain areas. When it comes to election results, I so I would want to hope that my side of the debate being like, yeah, I trust the election officials, that I'm more or less in an epistemic bubble. Like, I don't, I don't really know the arguments for uh, the, well, I mean, I, I come across them every once in a while, like, oh, some dead people voted, right? Turns mm-hmm. out, no, uh, they didn't. Or like two dead people voted in the state, they both voted for Trump. Uh, you see this come up. I don't know the actual, like, what is the best argument for Trump's side? I, in, and in some sense, I feel like that's like a shortcoming of our cultural environment is like, I wish that it would always be the case that on every contentious topic, everyone at least knew the good arguments or like mm-hmm. the, the mm-hmm. best available arguments for both sides. That would help a lot. But yeah. there's also the problem of there might not be an argument like it. <laughs> this, you know, human beings not always motivated by uh, reason, uh, you know, mm-hmm. rarely motivated by reason, I would say. Um, <laughs> so. W- like w- what it, w- there's a fundamental problem in living in such a hyper specialized world uh win points this out like i we just don't have the cognitive capacity or the resources the time and energy to learn enough about all of the different disciplines we would need to learn about to go around making our own decisions and judgments about all of the complex issues that we care about, you know, right. I believe climate change is like human anthropogenic climate change exists and it's posing a threat to the way we live our lives. Right. Is that because I understand the science and I understand (laughs) the statistical models that are necessary to quantify the, the, the geological samples? No, I don't get any of that. Mm -hmm. I have to outsource that to the experts. And then the the tough part is, well, there are some areas where we don't know who is an expert or it's just Mm -hmm. not clear what an expert looks like. And the moral domain is one of those. Um, And... You could say the the epistemological domain generally because there's <laughs> gurus all over convincing right. people. Yeah, I mean, I guess people believe in like all sorts of different stuff. So it's it's not obvious, at least. If you grow up in a more like, I guess, secular culture or one that values science, you might... Uh, you might just think that that's all that exists in the domain of knowledge. So you could, might be easier for you there, but, Hmm. but, um, so crucial, like, like what becomes crucial in this, uh, fractured environment in terms of the different intellectual disciplines is knowing when to trust and knowing who to trust. Mm Mm-hmm. And that is a question that we have to figure out. 
because I definitely don't trust those motherfuckers uh, at the Capitol building. <laughs> Uh, yesterday yeah Yeah. and i don't know if i trust the people um who are supposed to rely on to represent us and move the country in a direction that where we hopefully i mean there's all sorts of things we need to address but at least not that shit again uh yeah yeah. yeah, and then you have a bunch of people who don't trust the people who want to, you know, jab their arm with a vaccine, too. You know, a yeah. lot of people don't want to take the vaccine and they don't trust experts. And partially it's because Trump undermined them. But let's be honest, this has been kind of happening over the past right. several decades already. You know, like vaccine hesitancy is it predates Trump, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think, yeah, the. The book by Wentz, it's really interesting. And it's it really speaks to something that's been going on in our country for a long time. And maybe it's because of the internet. Maybe it's because of um, our lives being so individualist and skeptic of everybody. Yeah, so there's, there's just so much to, to go off. One, thi- one book that... Um that win cites as like crucial to him coming to that perspective is uh, I, I really want to get it and read it. I still haven't. It's called uh, the great Endarkenment. It's a funny title. Uh, the great <laughs> Endarkenment by Elijah Milgram is a professor of philosophy at, I believe the university of Utah, which is also where uh, C. Ty win is at um, good stuff good stuff all around yeah that's really that's really cool powerful stuff well i really appreciate you being on and and talking about this with me oh yeah do you have any like last word that you want to sort of shout out shout out uh shit what do you shout out in a in a time like this whatever whatever yeah seriously it's um it's crazy I no n- nothing particular uh people if people want to you know stay tuned with whatever I'm working on uh follow me on Twitter I spend every spend way too much time on Twitter um <laughs> my at is Dion teleologist is spelled D E O N T E L E O L O G I S T uh yeah that's go check that out i'll be coming up oh actually hopefully we'll get a youtube video out uh today maybe hopefully if i finish it where i'm actually like i I have a video um first one where i'm like taking a long form podcast of pluck rose and Lindsay describing their views because one thing i've been noticing is that when they package their views for an uh like when they're being interviewed there's a lot of misrepresentation sort of like opportunistically to either make their opponents look weaker or to make their views look stronger and Hmm. it doesn't always come up the same in their writings and I feel like mm-hmm. it would be useful to sort of like just collect all of that in one place and and put it out somewhere. So um, working on that, hopefully it'll be out soon. Uh, otherwise, you know, everyone have a good day. <laughs> no, that sounds good. And clean your I room. <laughs> 